All right, so today we're going to be talking about um, cell division and the cell cycle. And um, this is chapter 10, no, excuse me, chapter 11 in the Campbell and Reese AP Biology textbook. So here's your big questions. Why do cells need to divide? And then how does this provide for continuity of life processes? So as we discussed in a previous chapter, cells actually need to stay small in order to stay alive. It has to do with that square cube law. Um, the volume of a cell grows faster than the surface area of the cell, and the volume determines the nutritional contents the cell needs and also um, how much waste, metabolic waste products it produces. But those items can only enter and exit through the cell membrane, which is the surface area. So at some point, when a cell surface area to volume ratio gets too small, then the cell must divide in order to become you know, two smaller cells. So in the case of single-celled organisms, this is how they reproduce. But in multicellular organisms, this is how the organism actually grows itself. So we all, as human beings, start off as a, a zygote, a fertilized egg, just one cell. And then over the course of 40 weeks, that one single cell grows into, you know, a, probably a seven pound baby on average. Okay, so that's, that's pretty quick. Very, that's the most intense and rapid rate of cell division that a person experiences in, in his or her life. Okay. In addition to growing the organism, Cells have to divide as well to replace damaged cells. If you've ever been sick before, I'm sure we all have, we've lost cells to that sickness. So when you have a sore throat, say you had strep throat, that's a streptococcus bacteria that's infected the lining of your throat and it's actually eating the cells that are on the surface of your throat and they die. Um, and when you have an immune response to that, some of those immune cells go in and they engulf the bacteria in this case, and then those cells die, but the bacteria dies with them, you know, so we're constantly losing cells. And even when you're not sick, we have cells that just age out due to normal wear and tear, like your um, red blood cells in your cardiovascular system. Uh, red blood cells are basically just bags of hemoglobin, and their job is to carry oxygen all around the body, and oxygen oxidizes things, it's very chemically active, and so over time the red blood cells wear out and they need to be replaced. Um, and then some cells too our, are purposely programmed for cell death um, at all stages of life. It's a process called apoptosis and we'll talk more about that as we go through. <laughs> but in general, as, if it's a single-celled organism, it needs to maintain its surface area to volume ratio it's a multicellular organism that needs to physically grow the body larger or replace dead or damaged cells. All right, so here's an overview of the cell cycle. I'm gonna zoom in here. Okay, you will probably see this graphic. Again, I know it's in your book. You should familiarize yourself with it and know what all the stages are of the cell cycle and in what order they take place and the approximate um, length of time that cell spends in the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is the entire sequence of the cell going from just having divided until it divides again. There's um, two main phases we call interphase and mitosis and you can see the interphase is represented here by this orange orange bar on the outside and then the mitosis is this yellow section so you can see the bulk of a cell's existence is spent in interphase only a very short time is spent in mitosis and we're talking eukaryotic cells here okay now, interphase can be subdivided into these three phases. So G1, S, and G2, the three of those together equals one interphase. 
Um, G1 stands for growth, and G2 also stands for growth. There's just a first one and a second one. Put an I here for interface. Okay. S stands for synthesis. Okay. So in the G1 phase, the entire cell is growing larger, okay? And it's doing all the things the cell would do, going through cell respiration, um, photosynthesis, it's just a plant cell, um, making proteins, making phospholipids, all the things the cell does. In the S phase, the synthesis phase, the DNA in the nucleus will replicate itself. Okay, it's gonna make a copy of itself. Then in the G2 phase, there's some more growth going on, there's more metabolic activities going on. But in this phase, the cell is preparing for you know, the big show, it, it's, it's like a dress rehearsal. So the organelles are also duplicating themselves in this second growth phase. So the mitochondria actually do their own version of cell division and they do that independently from the, the main cell. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts will copy themselves and other organelles will, will get bigger and uh, divide as well. Okay. At the end of interphase, then you have the M phase for mitosis or meiosis, but we're only going to focus on mitosis right now. Meiosis is a bit more complicated. And mitosis is further subdivided. It has four, four other phases. Sometimes it's listed as five. It just depends on who's doing the dividing, and we'll talk about those more in depth. It's supposed to be a P, PMAP for short, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Sometimes there's a fifth one put in here called prometaphase. It just depends on just depends on what book you're reading. Okay, and then uh, the whole process repeats. Now, some cells are amitotic. A means not, so they don't do mitosis. A mitotic cells actually kind of exit the cell cycle and hang out here in what we call the G not phase, N A U C H T not, like nothing. Um, this is a non dividing state. So these cell cells just kind of hang out in an interphase like state and they do what they need to do. So an example of an amitotic cell is a neuron. And if you had anatomy before, you probably remember that. So the neurons, they do all, you know, the coordinating of your nervous system. So they do not spend any time going through cell division. Um, and this whole process is incredibly tightly controlled. Because if it is not, controlled, if the cells in your body, you're, you are a multicellular organism, if they are not coordinated and working together, then it's every cell for itself, and you no longer have a functioning multicellular organism. Instead, you have chaos. We call that chaos cancer. Um, and cancer is actually something we call an atavism. So an atavism is when you have an uh, a trait that reverts to a former state in its evolutionary history. So, for example, birds used to have teeth, now they don't. You know, their ancestors used to have teeth, now they don't. But every now and then, you have a genetic mutation and you have a chicken born with teeth. That's called an atavism. Same thing here. Unicellular life is a former ancestral trait of multicellular life. And if you have a cell in your body that evolves in, or has a mutation and then evolves its lineage into being single-celled again, that's an atavism. Um, multicellular life is incredibly freaking complex. It took a billion and a half to two billion years, something like that, for multicellularity to even evolve once we had the first cell. So it's, it's an incredibly complicated, tightly choreographed, dance of the cells in, in your body. Clear the drawings. Now, eukaryotic cells have a lot of DNA, like a lot, a lot. Like each cell, 
is roughly each cell's nucleus. If you were to take the DNA and stretch it out, it's roughly, was it three feet long, something like that, maybe four feet? It's a lot of DNA that's tightly packed. And DNA, if you pull it out of solution and break all its hydrogen bonds that are holding it in place, is actually rather delicate and it can physically break, like pulling, you know, snapping a rubber band. Um, so DNA is very uh, densely packaged into these structures called chromosomes during mitosis and also meiosis. The DNA is really, really tightly coiled and it's wrapped around uh, certain proteins that give it structure to help it to be able to move from one side, from the middle of the cell to one side of the cell without actually being damaged. You do need to know the anatomy of a chromosome. So this way, this length, uh, lengthwise piece is called a chromatid, and spelling does matter, chromatid. So this whole thing is a chromosome. It has two chromatids, and the chromatids are joined in the center by a centromere. It's a, there's a kinetic core uh, in the middle, proteins that hold it together. Each side is genetically identical, should be, to one another. So then they're called um, sister chromatids because they're genetically identical. Now, for eukaryotic species, many of them are what we call diploid or diploid, sometimes it's pronounced which means they have two copies of each chromosome. So we as humans have two copies of 23 chromosomes. Um, chimpanzees have two copies of 24 chromosomes. Fruit flies have two copies of two chromosomes. Um, I don't remember any others off the top of my head. Now plants get a little bit weird and some plants have different numbers, okay? Instead of pairs, they have quadruplets or octuplets. So for example, strawberries have eight copies of each chromosome, but plants are a little bit weird and we're not gonna focus on them. We're just gonna focus on the diploid. Ploidy number is how many copies, okay? So we as humans are diploid, di means two, strawberries are octoploid, octo means eight. Now, for prokaryotic cells, they're different. They don't have a nucleus. They have naked DNA, so they don't have any of those proteins holding their DNA into chromosomes. They just have a, or into linear chromosomes. They just have one circular chromosome that's not associated with any protein. Um, when they go through cell division, we call it binary fission, which I don't see listed here. So let me type it for you. Fission, like, like nuclear fission, splitting into two, and binary for two. Um, so prokaryotic cells have it a little bit easier. They just copy their one uh, circular chromosome, and then they just kind of elongate and pinch their um, cell membrane in the middle, and then you have two, okay, much simpler. But eukaryotes have physically more DNA, like it's more massive, and it is not arranged in loops. It's arranged in lines. So eukaryotes have many linear chromosomes. The number of chromosomes is unique to each species. And there's no correlation whatsoever with the number of chromosomes and its evolutionary history or its taxonomy, or how complex or how simple it is. It's just kind of random. Um, but you can see a little bit of a relationship sometimes within like say a genus or, a, um, you know, like so humans and chimpanzees are fairly closely related in the tree of life. They're our closest relatives and bonobos. Um, so they have 48, we have 46. Well, when you look at the chromosomes, there's, there is a human chromosome that actually has 
the remnants of a second centromere, and you can see that its gene regions are the same as two on a chimpanzee that just got fused together. So sometimes you can track some interesting evolution, evolutionary uh, accidents like that. But in general, just because a fruit fly has two chromosomes and an adder's tongue fern has a, a thousand some odd chromosomes, it doesn't mean one is better or worse or complicated or simple than the other. It, it's just kind of an accident of, of uh, evolution, how it turned out. Okay, so in, we'll, we'll go in more detail, but basically the cell starts off in the growth phase. It just has its chromosomes. They're all kind of loosey-goosey, hanging out as chromatin. Then they get replicated in the S phase. So now you have double the amount of DNA that the cell would normally have, but they're two identical copies of one another. So this is a chromosome here, even though it, it doesn't look, you know, kind of like an X. This is before replication happens, copying. This is after replication happens. Now you see like the two lines and they're joined in the middle. It looks more like an X and each half is called a sister chromatid, but the whole thing is called a chromosome. The whole thing is called a chromosome up here, and the same thing down here. After mitosis, the two sister chromatids actually get split apart, and one copy goes into each cell, assuming everything goes to plan. It is a little bit confusing, so just try to visualize in your head, you know, what's going on and at what stage you're on. Um, so back to haploid versus diploid. So these two are two terms you need to know. Diploid is two copies of every chromosome. So again, humans, we have 23 pairs. So we have two times 23, so we have 46 chromosomes total. Haploid is just when an organism has one copy of every chromosome. So I'm a woman, so I have ovaries, which make eggs, ova, and my ova are haploid. So they only have 23 chromosomes. If you are a man, you have testes, and they make sperm, spermatozoa, and those are also haploid. They have only 23. Okay, but every other cell in our bodies, with the exception of our red blood cells, because they all have a nucleus, Every other cell is diploid and has 46. Okay, you do need to know this notation. So the ploidy number is, we call it N, just by definition, N for the number of chromosomes. Diploid, we call it 2N because N is for how many chromosomes we have and the two times is for, you know, you have two copies of it. If this were um, a, strawberry. Okay, I told you they're octoploid, so strawberries are listed as 8N. Okay. Sometimes they may ask you to calculate how many chromosomes there are or what is the N number, so you have to be comfortable with the terminology and the math. Okay, so if I say, oh, this alien creature has 50 chromosomes and it's diploid, what is its N number? you should be able to divide 50 by 2 to get, you know, n. Sometimes they also ask you this. So how many chromatids are present? Well, technically in the G1 phase, there's none. Okay, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but they haven't replicated yet, so there's no chromatids. But in the G2 phase, you should have um, 46 times 2, so 92. Chromatid. So think about it. In the G2 phase, every single chromosome should be replicated. It'll look like this. And then, so each chromosome has two chromatids 
So if humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, you multiply the pairs to get 46, and then each of the 46 has two chromatids, you multiply that to get 92. So it's just a, a kind of like a logic puzzle. You just pay attention to the vocabulary and what it is they're asking you specifically to answer. All right, now mitosis. When we talk about mitosis and also meiosis, these terms only refer to the nucleus. So a prokaryotic cell does not go through mitosis or meiosis. So bacterial cells and archaea cells do not go through mitosis or meiosis. The eukaryotic cell goes through the cell cycle, and a part of the cell cycle is mitosis. So mitosis is nuclear division only, and we call it non-reductive. Meiosis is reductive, and what that means is in mitosis, the number of chromosomes at the end stays the same, but in meiosis, the number of chromosomes at the end is reduced. That's where we get the, the term reductive. We'll talk more about that when we get to meiosis. You should be able to um, look at a picture of a cell and determine what phase of the cell cycle it is in. So these are three different uh, pictures here. Um, the bottom two are light microscopes. The top one is like a fluoroscopy um, with uh, the colors added in. These are all three in interphase. So the two on the left are animal cells. You can see that because they're round. And the one on the right is a plant cell. Um, it's square. So even if you don't know, like from the name, you should be able to tell based on its shape, animal or plant. The so interphase, this is when you have the first growth phase. You have the S phase, synthesis, where the DNA is replicated. And then you have the second growth phase where the cell prepares itself for cell division. And this is the bulk of the cell cycle, like three quarters or two thirds, somewhere in there of the time that the cell, you know, spends in the cell cycle is on interphase. It's a little bit different depending on what kind of cell it is. Some cells go through the cell cycle quite rapidly, like your skin cells. Some cells go very, very slowly. After interphase is finished, then you go through mitosis. Mitosis has four, sometimes five phases, depending on how you divide it up. We're, we're just going to call it four. The first one is prophase, and it's the longest of the four uh, mitotic phases. So in prophase, the chromosomes condense. So at the end of interphase, the chromosomes are in the form of chromatin with an N. They're all loosey-goosey, like a pile of spaghetti. But during prophase, the chromosomes condense. So they organize themselves. They go from being loose to tightly structured around those proteins, forming those linear chromosomes. This takes time. While that is happening, the um, nuclear envelope, which is made of phospholipids, it breaks down. That doesn't do it spontaneously. You know, there's, there's, um, the centrioles start to form what we call spindle fibers um, in animal cells. And the uh, spindle fibers, they're made of actin protein they start to push and bust up the, the phospholipids of the nuclear envelope. So it starts to dissolve. Now, it doesn't mean it's digested. The phospholipids are still there. They just kind of hang out in the background and then they get reused again at the end of mitosis. Um, but it's the spindle fibers that are doing the, the dissolving. If it's an animal cell, the centrioles will duplicate themselves during this point. And so they, it starts on one side of the nucleus, and then the, um, the centrioles kind of pu push apart from one another after they've duplicated, so they're on opposite sides of the nucleus. 
Um, so you can see here in this picture of the, uh, was it the newt, I think? It has, this is the centriole here and the mitotic spindle starting to form. And then if you look at the darker uh, blobs here, that's the chromosome starting to condense. You can see them a little bit better here. And in fact, it was through studying plants that we first uh, discovered DNA at all and uh, through looking at chromosomes because plants have a lot of chromosomes because they tend to have more copies and they're big and easier to see in just a simple light microscope. So that's, that's where uh, Misha first discovered DNA. All right. Okay, so the notes is split it up into five. Sorry, I misspoke. So at some point, prophase sort of blends into prometaphase. And it's at this point where the chromosomes begin to migrate towards the center of the cell or the equator. And they don't just move on their own. The spindle fibers will um, attach to the centromeres and, and during this phase and the spindle fibers are kind of pushing and poking the, the chromosomes into the, the proper place where they need to be. Um, and by the end of this, the uh, spindle fibers will join at each centromere. And you, you can see here by prometaphase or the end of prophase, the chromosomes are much more linear. Okay, then comes metaphase. Metaphase is where it's really easy to identify this one. All of the chromosomes are aligned at the center of the cell. So the center can be called the metaphase plate or it can be called the equator. It just depends on who you're reading. Um, and you can see it really well. So this green here, th this part is the centriole, is the centriole, and these are the spindle fibers. And the blue here, these are the chromosomes. Um, and you can see here the chromosome. So it's the centromere that's lined up at the cell, or at the metaphase plate. Okay. The legs or the arms of the chromosomes, they're kind of just thrown wherever. Um, and remember the cell is 3D, so they're not actually arranged in a line, they're really arranged in a, a plane. You can see it even better here. Okay. And at this point, the spindle fiber actually like locks in to the centromere to a part called the kinetochore. Kinetochore, so it literally like hooks in and it makes a stronger connection. And it's this, um, at that point that the uh, chromosome, chromatids can actually be pulled apart. You can see here, there, there's a, we go, yeah, go a little bit bigger here. Very small, 0.5 microns, okay? So you can see the kinetic core part here and here. The next phase is anaphase, and uh, it's often called the most beautiful phase, and it happens really quickly. So if you you know find a, a video of a of mitosis on YouTube somewhere, anaphase, um, it's it's just really pretty to see. Um, so metaphase takes a little while, everything lines up, and spindle fibers are connecting in the kinetochore, and then. In anaphase, the chromatids, the sister chromatids, will split apart from one another, and this takes physical force. And how it does this, so the spindle fibers, they're made of actin. They um, uh, connect, the kinetic core, but the uh, centriole then at that point, the centriole starts to ratchet back the spindle fibers and, and pull. So there's, there's one on each side of the cell. So they pull the spindle fibers back and physically shorten them. And at some point, the pressure physically snaps the centromere into two. And then the chromatids will migrate to opposite ends of the cell separately from one another. So you can see there's a, um, you know, there's a picture here and a picture here.
telophase or telophase, depending on who's saying it, the, the fourth or fifth stage, final stage of mitosis. So at this point, it's sort of like the opposite of prophase. So the spindle fibers start to disappear and detach from the chromosomes. The chromosomes decondense, so they lose their um, organization and, and go back into the form of chromatin. The nuclear envelope reforms, except now there's two. So one is forming on either end of the cell. And you can kind of see that here a little bit. Okay. Then while telophase is happening, a separate process called cytokinesis is also happening. So cytokinesis is the whole cell dividing into two. So what will happen, it's different in animals and plants, but the cell membrane will pinch in, and then if it's an animal, it will pinch in with something called a cleavage furrow until um, the two cells are separated. Or if it's a plant cell, um, you have something called a cell plate that starts to form. So the plant cell has special vesicles that are um, full of cellulose that the plant has made. And then the vesicles will fuse along this plane in the middle. They'll fuse together and the phospholipids of the vesicle will make the cell membrane. Um, but the cellulose inside those vesicles will, will form and connect up. There's enzymes involved, form and connect up and make a new cell wall in the middle. But until it's fully formed, it's called the cell plate. We're not gonna worry about fungi. If they're different as well. Okay, so, oh, and here's what I said. So, cytokinesis, cyto is cell. The same thing as cyte, C-Y-T-E, means cell. And kinesis is, is a movement. Splitting. So it's the splitting of the cell into two different cells. So for animal cells, there's a nice picture of the cleavage furrow here. Okay. Um, there are microfilaments that sort of line the uh, plasma membrane here, and then they ratchet in smaller and smaller and smaller and drag the plasma membrane in with them until it pinches off into two, and then you wind up with two daughter cells. So we have sister chromatids and daughter cells. I think it was like scientists, you know, way of like appeasing women, since they didn't let women be scientists really in the, the before times. Okay. And then with plant cells, here's what I was narrating, and here's, here's a picture of it. So you have vesicles that come from both sides and they all merge in the middle, and then the cellulose inside them um, gets connected to make a larger piece of cellulose and forms the uh, first the cell plate and then a new cell wall. Okay, and what they mean by apportionment, how the organelles are divvied up into each cell, it's just random. Um, so it's not like, you know, oh, okay, 10 mitochondria have to go into the left cell and 10 have to go into the right cell. It's just random. As long as you have at least one mitochondria and at least one chloroplast on each side, you'll be good because those can replicate themselves and then the other structures can be taken care of by the nucleus. The same will be true of any solutes, any enzymes, any other proteins that are in the cell. It's just kind of random where they wind up. So here is mitosis. Oops. I wanted to zoom in here. Mitosis at a glance. So this is um, a little bit easier to to kind of picture it this way. Um, this is a nice model. It's, you know, scientists had to work from the actual photos from, you know, microscope from before to figure this out. But um, here you go. So here's the end of interphase, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Um, on the AP exam, they are not gonna ask you to draw this but you should be able to recognize it and talk about it if you see it in a picture. But on the IV exam, you are expected to draw the different phases. Um, so if you're drawing the different phases, it's not, you don't have to draw it as detailed as this. 
just make sure um, at the end of prophase and, and the beginning of telophase that you draw the nuclear envelopes as like a dotted line because they're breaking down or reforming. And then in um, metaphase, you have to make sure to draw the spindle fiber. Each chromosome has to have a spindle fiber attached to it on each side. And then the same thing in anaphase. Okay. So if you were to kind of look at these phases, spot the phases, anaphase is kind of easy to tell. You can see anaphase, here's an anaphase, there's an anaphase, okay. Interphase is kind of easy to tell too. Here's an interphase, here's an interphase, okay. All the DNA kind of looks uniform, like a dark bluish or purplish. That's because it's not condensed yet. Um, it's difficult kind of to distinguish prophase and prometaphase, but you can see that here's one in that prophase stage, prophase, prophase, okay. Uh, metaphase, here's one in metaphase. There's not as many in metaphase. Okay. And then this one, this large cell is at the end stage in telophase. And probably this one, this one too. Whatever picture you get given, you would need to identify what phase it's in, but they would make sure it'd be a very clear picture. Um, so the exams don't come in color. So they typically do something like this that can translate into black and white and they would uh, blow it up bigger and, and so you wouldn't have as many cells to look at. See if I can make this video. Nope. There you go. So this one's an animal cell because they're round. It's kind of interesting to see. There's anaphase. Okay. And that was in real time. It happens very quickly in the life of a cell. There's a little bit more information about this in your book, but we can actually track the evolution of mitosis as well as meiosis. Um, so there are some similarities. It's a little bit different if you're looking at um, the ancestors of plants versus animals versus fung fungi. Um, but it has to do with um, tracking the spindle fibers and, and uh, doing genomic analyses to compare, you know, different genes. But, but we do have a picture of how mitosis could have evolved. Um, when I talked to you about binary fission, I kind of left out, there's a structure called a mesosome that kind of grows out of the sides and will hook onto each loop of DNA to make sure it stays, one on each side. Um, and over time, you know, these, these have evolved into the spindle fibers. And the spindle fibers are just proteins, bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells can make proteins as well. So there, there is an evolutionary pathway um, for it. Um, proteins, homology is, you know, similarities, basically. Um, and we can track back um, when scientists look at various protists, which are the single-celled, it's the single-celled kingdom, but remember, you know, I've told you that scientists are seriously looking at reclassifying protists. You can look at protists that are very similar to animal cells, some that are similar to plants, some that are similar to fungi. So by doing a lot of studies on these dinoflagellates, they're similar. Um, to animal cells and then diatoms, these are fungi for the yeast and diatoms for plants. You can kind of trap these, you know, back into the past. Actually really kind of fascinating. Um, I just actually watched a video on, on uh, the current state of research of the nucleus and its origins and there's, there's a few different hypotheses. Um, so there's, it's still an area of research how that happened. Um, 
but it's an area of ongoing research and it, it's very interesting to me. Anyway. All right, and that is the end of our notes. So make sure you can do all of those things for your exam.